Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a little hand clap, a little shout. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Yeah, good. Good, good. I want to apologize in advance. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little congested this morning, so I'm a little foggy. So if, I, uh, if, I, if I'm stumbling a little bit on my words, that is why. But you know what? Jesus is still king, so he's, he happens to move regardless of our imperfections. He happened to actually already complete the work 2,000 years ago and has qualified you based on what he has done, not based on your perfection. That is good news. That is some really good news. We're going to do something a little bit different uh, this morning. We felt we had a prayer call on Friday with our leadership team, and after that prayer call, we just really felt the Lord like kind of nudging us in a little bit different uh, direction this morning. We're actually, as long as time allows, we're going to see, I've got a couple of things on my heart that I want to share this morning. We're going to see where that goes. We're going to find out what's in here together. All right, are you okay with that? We're going to see what's going on inside here, and we're going we're gonna to discover with each other what it is. So, like I said, we had a little last-minute change, and uh, the prophetic team is actually uh, potentially going to be coming up here during service and speaking words of encouragement, of exhortation over the body this morning. We just believe that the, the, the body just needs to be built up. We've been in an interesting time. Uh, the last three years or so, uh, how many of you know 40% of the church has left in America, in America? 40%. Like, that's not a statistic. These are our friends. These are our family members. These are people that uh, are hurt for whatever reason, maybe justified or unjustified. Maybe some of those that have just been grown complacent, some that just, they just don't want to deal with church anymore, and so they have left the building. And I've, I have heard and read people saying that we are in a post-Christian era in America. I think that we're just in the pre-rally for revival. Like... All throughout history, there have been people that have spoken that this America is in a dark spot right now. We're in the worst of the worst of the worst of times. And all that does is it creates a dark backdrop for his glory to be seen in this country. All it does is it sets the stage for a, a move of the Spirit beyond anything we have ever experienced before. And I am ready. I am ready. I, I want to be a part of this revival. I want to be a part of this awakening that this country desperately needs. How I many you know Jesus is the only answer to every issue that this country is facing? This, Jesus is the only answer to all division that this country is facing. Jesus is the answer to the division that the church is facing. I've been meditating over the last couple of months as I've been thinking about it, and, and honestly in my heart just grieving over the, the loss in the church. I, I have personal friends and family that have left the church, and it grieves my heart. It, it grieves me inside, and, and so I've been meditating over the last three or four months or so on the book of Nehemiah. I'm reminded of, of what took place in Nehemiah's time when the, the walls of Jerusalem were broken down. And Nehemiah, when he heard of this, he didn't just wait for somebody else to go and rebuild those walls. Look, he took that thing personal. He says, if those walls are broken down, Lord, please send me as the answer to rebuild those walls. There are a bunch of wall rebuilding people that are in this room right now. Those that remain, those that have been faithful to the flame, those that have said, I'm not going to turn away, I am not going to turn back, I am not going to look at something else, I'm going to keep my eyes upon Jesus, those are the people that he's asking to go and take their place upon the wall. Because the church in America needs a rebuilding. The church in America needs a little bit of healing. See, I believe so strongly that our, 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 uh, our state that we are in right now is one of division. It's, it's hopelessness. It looks like darkness all around. But Jesus is going to come as a healer and bring restoration to relationships that have been broken throughout this past season. I believe strongly that there are people that have had misunderstandings that are going to be clarified. They're going to be, they're going to be spoken into, and God is going to bring back, unite together his body once again. If you would, turn your Bibles to 
uh, Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to share something really brief, like I mentioned, just something that's been on my heart over these last few months. You see, as I've been thinking and meditating upon the church being broken down, and as I've been looking at Nehemiah, I've been asking the Lord for strategy. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 11, I believe it is, says that we are not ignorant of the devil's schemes. We are not ignorant of his ways. So I've been looking at Nehemiah saying, all right, the devil has the same bag of tricks that he's been using all throughout time. He has nothing new. All he can do is pervert truth. All he can do is lie and bring fear. And so I've been watching and experiencing as people have been uh, attacked in their marriages, in their relationships, in their jobs, in their workplaces, whatever it looks like. And it's, it is a perfect picture of what The enemy tried to do against Nehemiah as the wall was broken down. He is nervous and afraid of the church rebuilding itself once again. He is nervous of strong churches that stick together no matter what is taking place. He hates a people that stay united. He hates a people that's hearts say, I don't care what you have done. I'm not leaving your side until God gets the glory. He is looking for a people that will not waver and will not separate when things are getting difficult. So Nehemiah, he hears of this wall that is being broken down, and it strikes him in the heart. And he goes into a season, four months of prayer and fasting uh, to the Lord. And he's asking, God, would you stretch out your hand? Would you help us to rebuild this wall once again? He takes responsibility over that thing. He's not waiting for another to come. But he says, look, this has hit me, and it's hit me personally. Send me, Lord. Let me be the one that goes back to the wall. I will go and do it. Let your favor come. And he goes to his king that he was the cupbearer at the time, and he asked for the the king to grant him favor to go back to Jerusalem and to help to rebuild the wall. And so he goes, and uh, in chapter 3, if we actually... Chapter 3 is such a beautiful picture of the body of Christ, of what it would look like if the body, each person came together. It says this in verse 1, Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hanel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zachar, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And it goes over and over and over again how each family took their place upon that wall. Like they all have the same purpose. It's to rebuild the wall, but what they are working on is going to look different. You know, we, we believe strongly, and you've heard us talk about this many, many, many times here in this church is that the body of Christ, each and every person that is in here is called into ministry. You see, we're not a a place where you come and maybe you give a little bit to support watching other people on the platform do ministry. Like, this is not ministry. This This is ministry, but this is not the end of what ministry is. Like, where you are in your workplace and in your family's lives, at, at Meyer, at, at, at Horrocks, or, or maybe Trader Joe's if you're a little uh, ritzy, or, uh, you know, maybe that's where your ministry is. <laughs> I just said ritzy. I, have no, I don't think I've ever said that word in my entire life, ritzy. Bougie. There we go. Whole Foods will send you into bankruptcy. I walked into Whole Foods and walked out of there with like $43 uh, for a kombucha. I, I bought four bags of coffee, or no, two bags of coffee and four boxes of tea there, and it cost me $110. I had to mark that up for my business as research. That was, that was market research in that moment. If, many, if those that don't know, I'm a coffee roaster. So anytime when I do something stupid, I'm, I'm like, all right, there's got to be a way to expense this. If we could cut that out for the IRS, too, after service, that would be really, I'd really appreciate that. I know that we're live streamed, and I do pay my taxes. Uh, I give to Caesar what he is due, but I don't give him more than that. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where I was going with this. Each and every person is called into ministry. 
Like every person in here has been born into a battle to expand the kingdom of heaven here upon this earth, and it is done through love, and it takes each and every person having their place upon the wall. Not looking over at their gate like, man, I wish I could build that gate, but I'm stuck here with this gate. Or looking over at the other section of the wall, man, I wish I could rebuild that portion of the wall, but I'm stuck here with my portion of the wall. Each and every person, no matter what section of the wall it is that you find yourself on, Every section is important for the strength of that wall to come together. Every member of the body of Christ to build up the full stature, the measure of who Christ is here upon the earth, is important. Say, I am in ministry. You said it. Good job. And my role is important. Everything that you do, no matter what it, what it looks like, you have been called for an absolute time as this to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The church is broken. It is at, the devil is at our doorsteps, and it is time to rebuild this thing. The season of mourning over the past is over, and it is time to grab our hammers and to get back on the wall and get back to fixing this thing back up. Because there is a king that is coming. There is a king at the end that will return to this earth, and he is looking for a people that have been found faithful through the process. So they go, and each person is, is rebuilding the, the wall together, everybody in their own place. But then listen to this. Chapter 4, Sanballat, uh, verse 7, Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward, and that the breaches were beginning to clo be closed. They were angry, and they all plotted together to come and to fight against Jerusalem, and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God, and set his guard, as a, set a guard as a protection against them day and night. We skip forward. Many of us have heard this message based uh, out of Nehemiah. This is nothing new. Uh, but we, uh, we understand that each person then went back onto the wall. They went back with a, a hammer in one hand and a sword in another. Let's go down to verse 15. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. You see, everybody knew. They, they, they weren't negligent. They weren't ignorant that the devil could come at any moment and try to attack them. They are aware of his schemes, but at the same time, they knew that they had a wall to build. And then they, we keep going. Each of the builders has a sword strapped to his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And this is the part that I want to focus on. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of trumpet, of, of the trumpet rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. You see, during the building time, everybody took their place on the wall. It said, this says that they were widespread. They were all taking on the thing that was set before them. But when the enemy attacks, when the sound of the trumpet goes, it's time for the people to come together. Look, when we all are building what it is at the vision that God has given us, we all need to find our place on the wall. But when the devil is knocking at the door, it's not a time to try to fight alone. When the devil is knocking on the door, it's not a time to try to isolate ourselves and get picked off outside of the body of Christ. He says this, he says, when you hear the trumpet, it's time to rally together. And the trumpet is blowing over the church right now. And the devil is watching as everybody's scattering and trying to fight him on their own. Look, this is a time for us to come shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, to actually come together to fight this good fight of faith with one another and not against one another. There's going to be disagreements. Welcome to humanity. Have you ever talked to somebody? 
Yes, there's the disagreement that comes out of every single thing that we can do in life. There are always opportunities for things to not go the way that we want them to go. But what we need to do as a body of believers, I'm speaking to the church as a whole, but also to this community itself, is that when we are hearing of things, when we are hearing the whispers of the enemy, we need to be careful to not go out and entertain the conversation. But what we need to do is come together with our brothers and sisters, find ourselves on our knees, and actually fight the one that needs to be fought. We need to stop fighting one another. We need to stop turning our swords upon one another and actually come up into a place of authority and pray against the principalities, the strongholds, the powers in heavenly places that are trying to bring confusion against us. We continue going and Chapter 6, Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that he had built the wall and there was no breach left in it. I'm in verse 1. You guys are doing great back there. I didn't give you any scripture references. I honestly didn't know what they were going to be, so we're doing this together. You guys are crushing it. Yay, media team. Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together out in the plain of Ono somewhere. But they intended to do me harm, and I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Look, there, are, there is a temptation right now in this post-Christian era of America. There is a temptation to resolve everything with human reasoning. To try to take us off of the wall. To take us off of the thing that God has called us to do. I'm talking about out of the church, but also out of the assignment that you have been given here upon this earth. Look, your position in Christ is signed, sealed, and delivered. It is only because of the blood that you are making it to heaven. There is nothing more, nothing less that you can do to get there, but you have all been assigned a position in the body of Christ for a purpose, and the purpose is right now. We all have things that God has called us to carry out in our lives, and if we're not careful... We can be distracted by human reasoning. Look, why don't you come down from the wall? I'm not really sure that what you're building right now is very safe. Why don't you come out here and talk to me? And it says over and over and over again, Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem had sent a message five times until Nehemiah just said, you know what, I'm not coming down off this wall. And when that didn't work, they then came up with an accusation against them. It says this in verse 6, and it's written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem, Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel, and that is why you are, are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So now come, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent him, saying, no such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Now when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they, they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away, and what man such as I could go into the temple and live, I will not go in. You see, the, the enemies in this time and with Nehemiah, they gave him three temptations that took place. The first one was to come out and to reason with them. The second thing that they did is they brought accusation against them when they couldn't get them to come off the wall. And when the accusation didn't work, then he used somebody that was in the house that he was in to convince him to preserve his life. Look, we just came out of a time where self-preservation was the main focus of our lives. And it can be easy in a, in a season like this, in a time like this, if we are not careful, if we are listening to the complaints, the words of the enemy, it can be easy to separate, to isolate, and to preserve ourselves from getting hurt, 
from getting, from going through the pain that we had once experienced before to separate us from the great work that God has called us to. Look, if you've been here long enough, you know that it's no surprise or it's no, uh, it's, it's nothing new that there are, there are things, there are divisions that are trying to take place in this house. There are things that are trying to separate people, that are trying to tear apart the work that God called. It is not the work that he has given us or that we have come up with. It is a work that is sent down from heaven. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves even in the camp of human reason, in the camp of accusation, or in the camp of self-preservation. You see, in 2 Corinthians, as I mentioned in the beginning, it says to not be ignorant of the ways that the devil is working in our lives. He says we're not ignorant of his schemes. We're not ignorant of his design. And if we're not careful, we think the things that are taking place in the natural, we're taking them at face value as if there is just a natural fight that we are fighting here on this earth. We are in the middle of a supernatural battle to see heaven come to earth. And it can look very natural. If we're not careful, we can reason it away with human understanding. This person is that. That person did this. This person said that. That person said this. This is too hard. What about my bank account? What about this? What about that? And we get down into a horizontal level of living when we are called to live from a heavenly perspective. We are called to speak in an unseen realm that which we desire to see in the seen realm. The unseen was made before the seen. And what is manifesting in the natural is nothing more than a result of the accusations of the devil to try to divide the body of Christ. And I want to put a call out to this community starting today. I would love us to go through 21 days of prayer and some sort of fasting together as a community. Because I know personally, as I said, this is not just a statistic. These are my friends and family that have left the church. I know personally the heartache that many people are going through. And it's not just this church. I've spoken with other pastors that have gone through the same thing, that are, that, that are, that are feeling the same way, that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. That no matter what is said, there is some sort of word twisting that is taking place that is trying to divide the people of Christ. It is not a time when we are under attack to separate. It's a time to come together shoulder to shoulder. It's a time to come together as an entire community and to find ourselves on our knees that say, I will take responsibility to rebuild these walls. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to fix it. I'm not going to wait for the pastor to tell me what to do. I am going to get before the face of God. I'm going to seek his face and say, Jesus, come and heal your church. He does not desire a people to be broken and scattered and separated. Many of the things that we are experiencing here in America, if we went to the church in China, they would laugh at us over our divisions. These people are getting murdered for saying Jesus, and we don't want to go to church because somebody hurt our feelings. We don't want to go and, and talk to somebody because we're not sure how we'll feel afterwards. Look, the way that the devil feels right now is he is excited about the division that is taking place in the church universally and in this house. This is not a time for us to stay separate, but to get shoulder to shoulder, to get on our knees and to seek the Lord. I, I feel this so strong in my heart. It's been the last two or three months that I've just, I have been praying over our community, over the Grand Rapids area, that there would just be a wholeness and that there would be healing. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, and there was a lot of, just a lot of the strife, a lot of conversation over the, you know, the struggles and just people on people conflict. And I said to the person, I said, do you believe in unity in the body? And they said, absolutely, I pray for it. They're, you know, I could see that they got excited about the unity of the body. I said, it's as practical as this. Like we are waiting for unity to come to us when the Lord is asking for it to come through us. Like we're waiting for something on the outside, for some tornado to come down from heaven and to unify the church. But what it looks like is not caring about petty disagreements. 
It's not caring about petty things and actually fighting for relationships, pressing into hard conversations, pressing in. There may be real hurt that you've experienced. There may be real hurt that other people have experienced. There may be things that you have done to hurt others, things that they have done to hurt you. But at the end of the day, that is the point of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that it is a bunch of imperfect people that are justified, made righteous by the sacrifice that he did and not based on our works. And when we're holding people to their, to their imperfections, we are saying the cross was not enough for them to redeem them. When we are holding people to their imperfections, we are saying you have to figure it out before you can come into the family of God. When it is the exact opposite, it is the very power that brings us into unity is the fact that we are not perfect and his blood unites every one of us. And so I would love to call this church uh, prophetic team, if you guys would make your way up here. We're going to speak some destiny over individuals in this place, but I don't even, it's not an officially organized thing, but we'll figure it out tomorrow. But 21 days will put us at October 1st. Starting today, if today was day one, I would love for three weeks that we as a community commit to pray for the healing in this house. For healing to come and for revival to move, to awaken that which is dead, to awaken that which has been, wow, there are a lot more of you. I thought there was like three of you that were going to be up here. More showed up. Great. Awesome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, and then I want to ask also that you would ask the Lord, <laughs> you come on up, you come close to me. <laughs> You're good, whatever you want to do. Um, but in that 21 days, I would like, uh, and it's only those that, that are feeling compelled by this, but I, I want to invite you into this. Of ask the Lord what it would be that he would send a, uh, some sort of clarity as to things to fast throughout this season. Maybe it's not the full 21 days, but... Maybe three days of a fast or a day full fast or maybe you do just juice for a week. Whatever it is that the Lord is asking you. But something that says to heaven like, look, Jesus, I know that there is brokenness in the church. And I am taking responsibility to be one of those that are going to come and rebuild the wall. It is not a time for us to stand back and to point. It's a time for us to get on our knees and ask for Jesus to do what only he can do. We cannot fix the church in America. But with him, we can do all things. Without him, we are absolutely nothing. And in 52 days after the Israelites put their hands to the work, it says that they had a mind to work. In 52 days, the walls were restored. Something was done that they thought could not have been done. We may be in a time where people are saying the church in America is dead, but I believe that there is a people that say, no, we are just getting set up for a great awakening. And so if you would commit to praying for the 21 days, for healing in this house, for a revival in this city, to be a part of what it is that God is doing, I would ask that you would stand real quick. Thank you, Jesus. We're making a commitment before the Lord. This isn't a guilt trip kind of thing, but I, I feel serious about what it is that the Lord is saying, that if a commitment, I'm asking that you would follow through on that commitment. That every day for the next 21 days, we pray for healing and for restoration over relationships in this house and for restoration of the church of the body of Christ, for broken relationships that have happened in other communities in the Grand Rapids area, because I believe that Jesus is weeping when he sees us fighting, turning our swords against one another, when there is a great work that needs to be done. There is a great work that he is calling us to do. So Jesus, we come before you this morning, and we start today, we say yes to this mandate that you have sent from heaven to rebuild the walls of the church, for the protection, once again, for the church to come together, to be unified here on this earth, and we are committing to praying, to fasting, to seeking your face over the next three weeks until October 1st, that you would be able to get the glory, Jesus. It's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves but we can do it with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, we've got, uh, as I mentioned, we, we had said something to the prophetic team, I think I texted Friday or Saturday, and just asked that they would be praying throughout the weekend over 
people that they know or won't know are going to be here and just to release words because the thing about accusations, the thing about the, 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 uh, the, the time that we're in of divisions is it steals our confidence. It steals our confidence in the work that God has called us to. And the devil's really good at trying to break our confidence down so that, as I said earlier, we would get off the wall. But I believe that pr prophecy is such a powerful way to fight back, to speak destiny over people, to speak their calling, their purpose that they've been created for, to remind them who, ha who haven't created them to be. So who, uh, who's, who's got something new that wants to go first? I'm a brave one. So as Matthew asked me to um, pray about this, um, in my quiet time, what came to mind was how um, the devil seeks to take us out by being a roaring lion. He's like a roaring lion. He's not the lion of the tribe of Judah. He just seeks to intimidate and scare us. I'm not going to embarrass anybody by, like, pointing people out, um, but I just want to speak to anyone in the room who's been afraid of like the things that are coming on the earth, the things that are coming against the U.S., the wars and the rumors of wars, um, high-level um, EMPs, the electromagnetic pulse things that um, are all over the internet. What I, when I asked God about this, he said, Lori, the sun generates 10 billion nuclear weapons worth of energy, and I spoke that into existence. So if there were to be an EMP, don't you think I couldn't just go like this? Psh. Like, that's what he does. That's what he did when he parted the Red Sea. So I want to exhort you to be of good courage if those wars, rumors of wars, scary food shortages are things that, like, leave you feeling a little shaky because things are shaking all around, don't get shook. And if you still feel like anxiety um, after the service when we do ministry time, come on up and we will pray for you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for deliverance from the fear and the anxiety because God's got you. Uh, real quick, let's, uh, I, I didn't realize how late it is already. It's already 11.30, so let's keep it to maybe a minute a piece or so, 30 seconds to a minute, and just be direct in what it is that you're feeling like the Lord is saying. Boom. Go. All right. Amanda. Amanda. Look at me, Amanda. <laughs> yes. The Lord wants you to know how pleased he is with you. He loves your smile. He loves your sense of humor. And the ministry you carry is going to be, um, well, it is well known in heaven today. I was even thinking, um, as Matthew was reading the names of the families, those guys were just building a wall. None of them knew that their names were going to be written in Scripture for all of eternity, for, for us to be reading. They were just going about their day, doing a very common thing. And you are not a common person, and you're not doing a common thing, and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and your story is being celebrated every day in heaven, and I am so grateful for you. Yep. Um, I don't know who you are. Gentleman in the white t-shirt, you have glasses on. That's you, yes. Are you in college? Yes, all right. So while you were up front um, worshiping, I really felt as though that you're a very creative young man. You have a lot of gifts and talents, and it's actually causing a bit of confusion in your life because you don't quite know what to do with yourself. You don't know where God wants to use you or, or where you should go in life. So I just want to encourage you to not get all wrapped up in all the details. Don't get too wrapped up in the fact that you are multi-talented. I also want to come against um, any word curses that have been spoken against you that you don't have a focus and you don't have a purpose because you are so talented. Um, so I just want to come against that. And I, I want you to press into God closer and harder and maybe do that thing that scares you the most. So.
All right, I have a word for, you're sitting next to Becky Hillbrands in the black shirt right there, wavy hair. Yes, you. Um, I just heard the phrase over you, you're my ruby, um, and I just feel like God, God's speaking that over you, like you're such a treasure to him, um, and you're so precious to him. Um, but I also, um, the other impression I thought was, I feel like the Lord's saying to you, like, give me a second chance. I don't know if there's an area in your life where maybe there's been, there's been brokenness and pain and you're wondering about should you step out in it again or, or go for it again. Um, not that the Lord's the one that let you down, but people have let you down. Um, and he's just, he's wanting to reach out and bring healing and wholeness to you and invite you into that, that courage to, to give it a second chance. Um, and then, Fanny, I have something for you. I just felt like, just felt the Lord's encouragement over you this morning. Like, he's just so pleased with you and so delighted in you. Um, you're someone who's been so faithful. Um, and you've been faithful in, in really hard, unseen things or even things where people have told you, like, oh, don't, don't worry about it. But you've stayed faithful. Um, and I just feel like God is so delighted in that, and I feel him saying to you, like, dream bigger. Like, he wants to invite you into a season of dreaming, um, and he just wants to bless you. sung I actually have a word for you. I saw you out in the lobby and joked, oh, you better get back in there. The prophetic team is going to be up there. And then I felt from the Lord that he has something for you, and what I saw was a rainbow over your head. And I felt like it just stood for the promises of God, that all the promises of God are yes and amen. And I saw, like, Joseph, how he saw ahead of time, like, the promise, and he could see the palace and whatever things God had called him to. And it was just this long process. And um, I just wanted to encourage you in the process. Um, I saw you as a builder um, and that God is just taking you on this journey, on this process, but know that his promises are yes and amen. And the things specifically that he's spoken over your life will take place um, in the way, in his time, in his way. And then this um, lady in the front here, I had a word for you. Yes. Yeah. Um, during worship, I kept hearing this song God gave me a, a while ago, so I just wanted to sing it over you. And it's um, Little bird standing there looking at the sky. Don't you know I have given you wings to fly? Little bird standing there looking at the sky. Don't you know I have given you wings to fly? So just fly. And as I was hearing that song, I was reminded like when birds first learn to fly, it's like it is a lot of work. Like it's not natural and it just, it can be challenging, but he's given you the wings and like keep pressing in and, and let him just take you and cause you to soar. Uh, so this morning, I, I thought of you, Trevor, so we're going to go with that. Um, I, um, I just really feel God's heart for you, and I think he just wants to remind you how close you are to him, how dear you are to him, and um, I feel like there's increase coming to your business, um, that he wants to increase your influence, uh, bring expansion to you and to your family, so I bless you um, with the abundance of heaven, and I feel like there's also, um, like I heard the word release over you, and so um, I felt like it was connected to the things of your heart um, and in the spirit. So uh, I, I bless you with the release of um, all the things that you were carrying, all the things that the Lord is wanting to release inside of you and, in, and through you. Um, yeah. So bless you. So I felt... Uh, I felt Father God's heart of encouragement and building up. Really the, the groom wanting to know his bride, uh, what he's doing in and through her, and uh, that he's not forsaken her. And, um, and it's appropriate for him because then that's what the message was about. Uh, but the thing that I saw, especially, the, I feel like there's people visiting uh, today and that maybe it's also your first time or just the first couple, few times. 
I, I felt like I saw people crying out for, God, I want revival. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty for your presence. And there is this aching for, for God and for an encounter to be changed and transformed. And yet then what's come next for you, for us, these last few years is wilderness. It's been pressure. It's from economics, financial. It's, it's, but, but especially I feel like it's been relational. There's about a lot of relationships that have been pressing and, and, um, and, and coming. And, and you're wondering, okay, well, God, like, if I'm hungry and if I want revival and I feel like there's things going on, I feel in the atmosphere that there's things, then why am I going through wilderness? Why does it feel like that? And, and, I, and I felt like God was saying a few things. Just, again, for building his bride, why, not, why wouldn't he be after his bride's heart? And for this unveiling of Jesus the Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope of glory, glory is his presence. So the hope in us of being his presence, of Christ in us. So this Jesus was sent out into the wilderness and the point was to be tested and tried of the devil, right? But the goal was that he was coming out in power. And so I felt like this encouragement of knowing, instead of being discouraged that that has, that's been difficult, that there's been people rubbing against you, well, how do you know what's in you until it comes out by pressure, right? And so then this intense pressure, and then you have a reaction, and it comes to the surface, and now you have the opportunity. Jesus, thank you for showing me. Now here it is. It's yours. Now what do you want to do with it? I offer it up to you. And now I receive you, Jesus. Fill every void, fill every place. And now there is revival. So instead of shrinking back, instead of shrinking back from difficulty, run to it. Run to it. I just want to encourage you in that. He's working in you. So. Is there anyone named Peter here? Anyone named Peter? All right. Well, maybe it's for online for another time, but I just felt like, Peter, if you are watching or watch this later, I just feel like God is bringing you into a time of, like, deep healing um, and instruction, and the Lord wants to raise you up to be a father of the house. I don't know if that's the church or just in your home, but I bless what God is doing in your life. And I also just had a word for all the mothers here. Oh, um, you are amazing, and I just feel like God has the biggest heart for you, that he loves you, and he just wants to encourage you and say, keep going because you are doing a good job. You are planting seeds that will reap eternal fruit that is good because you are sowing good fruit, and you're doing a really good job, and God really loves you and is for you. Okay, I have three words. So, um, Vanessa, you were really highlighted to me, and I just felt like the Lord loves your family and the obedience that you have um, in this church, and I just felt the word entrepreneur over you, that God is going to pour out some more deeper wisdom and entrepreneurship over your life and a blessing over your family. And then, I don't know your name, but you have a yellow shirt back there, um, and you have some glasses. I think you have glasses on, too. Um, I just felt that God really sees you. And I felt like you sometimes come against this lie that you're not seen. And so I just wanted to break that off of you. And I saw you just doing a lot of creative things, like drawing, painting, and just being creative with God. And you have such a creative mind, and he loves that about you. And I just bless your creativity and the way that you are just going to steward in this, in creativity with um, just art. And then I also got a word, too, for you with glasses. You have a shirt, um, and I gave you a word, too. <laughs> you have a shirt with, like, a bunch of um, flags on the back. And um, I saw all the different, like, nations, and I felt like the Lord just loved your obedience and that sometimes you come against this lie that I don't know how to be obedient or have confidence in the Lord, but the Lord sees you. And I actually saw um, there's, like, a bunch of flags, but I saw the flag of Germany added to your shirt. And so I just bless whatever God's doing with whether that looks like praying for Germany, going to Germany, just being around German friends, whatever that looks like. I just declare that over you. 
Amen. Uh, there was one more thing that at the end, uh, I want to invite you up. If there, somebody had a word of knowledge for, for knees, for healing, for knees. So when we, when we invite the ministry team uh, up at the end of service, if that's you, please come up and get prayer.